What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the African Five Aside podcast. Today, I'm honored to be joined by my, my big brother from Nigeria, uh, Oluwashina Okeleji, uh, an African football specialist, uh, one of, in my opinion, the people that I look up to in this in this sphere because he has so much experience. He's so knowledgeable. His contacts are great. Uh, and so, so I'm really happy to be with him to talk about his country, Nigeria, uh, and this upcoming 2023 African Cup of Nations. So, Sheena, um, we're going to get started just with what I like to call the State of the Union, meaning, you know, in the United States, they have like the president, he sits up in front of the Congress and he has to brief them on how the country is going. Can you do the same thing with Nigeria? How is Nigeria's atmosphere? How do the supporters feel? Are they confident? Are they not confident? I know there was a very tough international window. What's the State of the Union going into the AFCON? Well, thanks very much, um, Mahir, for having me. and. Uh... Um, it's good to be to be on your show. Um, quickly, I think um, for Nigeria, just re- go back to 2013. The, the feeling is similar to 2013. You know, um, people aren't happy with the selections. People are not happy with you know results in the build up to the um, tournament itself. So it tells you the story of how Nigerians feel going into this tournament. And because they they have this sort of thing with the Super Eagles now, where people have completely lost. Um, hope in the new man in the manager Jose Pesero, and of course his selection and um, results in the last few months haven't really convinced. You know, playing two World Cup qualifiers, drawing against supposed called so called minos in um, you know um, teams whom they obviously felt Nigeria should have beaten. That really set the tone for the expectations of the fans going into this African Cup of Nations. Fans have lowered expectations; they don't think the team can do much. But we've seen this before. The only difference is that it was Stephen Keshi. And then, you know, and um, I mean, rest his soul. He went on to win the AFCON. Some people in Nigeria, probably in in the lowest of percentage, feel like this could similarly be like 2013 all over again. But in reality, it is not the same at all. Um, so people aren't really excited about this tournament. Um, it's happening not too far from Nigeria in the Ivory Coast. Traveling, logistics. You know the, the 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 economy in the country situation of things in Nigeria. People are really going through a lot. There's the um, you know gas, which is fuel scarcity in the country. The economical you know um, problems, financial crises, and the recession in the nation. So people aren't really um, you know excited. Football is like an escape for a lot of people in Nigeria. But what I, what I can assure you is that once the tournament kicks off proper. Nigerians, even though they are not really confident of the performance or the or whatever or concerning their team, they will be cheering the team. Remember, they are Victor Osime, the the, uh, the African footballer of the year. So in Victor Osime, I don't think anyone expects him to be the goal scorer, the midfielder, the defender, as well as the goalkeeper. So you can't really go into a tournament having one star player and everyone will be excited. But in Victor Osime, Nigerian feels like, you know, hmm, there's, a, there's, there's the reincarnation of Rashidi Yekini. And maybe Nigeria can do well in the tournament. That's very high praise about the, the recall to Yekini. Uh, just, just to recap sort of what we're saying, Nigeria, we're, like Algeria, we're not at the World Cup. Uh, they uh, had a, a this, uh, I would say, a below par African Cup of Nations. Uh, and in this World Cup qualifying, they start off with two draws against Lesotho and Zimbabwe. However, yeah. their star boy, Victor Osimhen, a player who we heard about maybe six years ago as an under-17, went up and then down a little bit. And now he's on top of the world, I think top 10 in Ballon d'Or, uh, an African player of the year. And if I'm not mistaken, his first African Cup of Nations. Is there a lot of excitement to see him at an African Cup of Nations? He was there in 2019, but he only played um, half, and half of football in the third okay. place game against um, Tunisia. Um, yeah, so a lot of people are excited about seeing him. The last tournament in um, Cameroon that he didn't come for, um, a lot of people felt like Napoli, rather than Victor Simon, opted our ball. Because he, he know, broke his about, nose like... Yeah, I think you got remember before, the facial the yeah. injuries and all that. And um, But for this particular tournament, everyone feels like it's his tournament because he's the star player, he's the biggest name in the Nigerian squad. So, he's, I mean, you talked about when he broke out, it was um, actually over eight years ago, um, the 2015, uh, 2015 on the 17th. You know, and um, Victor is Victor is the 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 way to describe him is very simple. He's the typical Nigerian striker. Never gives up. Is he, is a menace to defense. Is a menace to goalkeeper. Is a menace to everyone around him. Is that player that you he, he can make something happen 
out of nothing. So it's been a while Nigeria have seen a player like that. They've known, I mean, since the days of, um, you know, Peter Odeminge, who we call Osazi Odeminge back home, um, is that player who goes into a fight and is giving everything. Victor, even if you watch his last game at his club, um, the one he, he picked up a red card, you you see that he was going back. And so he defends. He's not somebody who just sit back. I'm a top nine. Let me stay back. So he fights for the ball. So that is the typical striker. And that is the kind of player that Nigerians, whether he's having a bad game or anything, they will still be cheering him on. So he carries the hopes of a nation. So I, on his young shoulder, he's just 25. And everyone is talking about him like he's been around forever. No, he's, he's, it's, it's, it's only a player who made a name in the under-17, like you said, the top scorer, the, the highest goal scorer in the history of under-17 with 10 goals. So there's so much on his young shoulders. And after years of struggle, he's finally coming to his own. And um, he's the big name in Nigerian football. So, so Sheena, um, we talked about the struggles of the last two years, but in AFCON qualifying, you scored a lot of goals. I know there was Sao Tome Principe in the group, and that's like a little bit of a, you know, like a, a gimme. But everybody talks about Nigeria's star power. I mean, when you look at the list of names, I don't like to compare, you know, footballers to body types, but Nigeria is kind of like an hourglass. You have, you know, a lot of strikers like this, no midfielders, and then a lot of <laughs> some good defenders as well. Mali is the opposite. Mali are like, you know, the midfielders like this and no strikers. But uh, but what I wanted to ask you is why and how does Nigeria produce so many strikers? Is there like some kind of secret sauce in Nigeria? Is it just the fact that you guys had so many great strikers in the past players like Yekini that, that influenced the younger generation? Is there a really good academy? Is there some kind of sociological reason for why Nigeria produced so many strikers? I think it's never difficult to figure that out. Ask yourself. Mention the top 10 players in the world. It will be strikers. Yeah, you players. talk Aland, you talk Mbappe, you talk all these players, you understand? So if you mention all of these stars, the only factor there is that these, um, you know, the, the, these young stars growing up, Austin Okocha said something similar a um, few months ago. He says, the reason why we have a lot of strikers in Nigeria is because everyone wants to be a striker. Nobody remembers the man who created the assist. Unless you have to be better than JJ, brilliant like Maradona, good like Messi. In midfield, that's when people will remember you. You know, so everyone wants to score a goal. The chances of going to Europe or playing in top European football across the world or playing in top leagues across the world is to be a striker. So that's the fascination. That's the dream. That's the ambition of everyone. And everyone they always look up to has to be a winger or a striker. You have to be very fast. You have to you have to be scoring goals. And like I said, um, Cameroon produced goalkeepers and some other brilliant things. But when it comes to African football, Nigeria produced them strikers the same way Ghana will produce midfielders you know so it's I think it's just how you know you look you look up to certain players you look up to so in in the society in the minds of a lot of people being a striker is the key for everyone being a striker is everything if you ask a Nigerian player what's your position I'm a striker you know no one wants to stay in goal no one wants to be in goal so I think that's just the old concept that's how we build our strikers and because we value legendary names in the striking positions as well very good so so let's move on to the coach um you said that Jose Pissero, you know, he's lost a lot of confidence in the country. Um, what I'm curious about is I want to talk about, you know, him as a coach. Does he have a particular style? Um, and also, it seems like, I mean, when I watch Nigeria play, it seems like he's trying to cram in a lot of those strikers. And and if I'm not mistaken, he's mostly been playing this 4-2-4 formation uh, with a player like, for example, Alex Duwebi, who's like usually more of an attacking midfielder, he'll play deep. And you're just trying to get as many, many, like, and sometimes the Nigerian team seems like it's split into two. Um, give me your observations. Well, you don't have to be too critical if you want, but uh, how do you see Jose Pesero, uh and his tactics? What kind of, like, formation do you like to use, his history? And how is he seen in the country? How do Niger What do Nigerians think of him? Um, first and foremost, I think um, Jose Pesero from the beginning of the discussion involving um, uh, Nigeria and the Portuguese manager, I think a lot of people didn't really think it's that coach that met the criteria of the kind of um, um, coach that should be, you know, managing Nigeria. But um, his appointment came under the previous um, federation president, Amar Jupinik. Um, and what was the key thing to say, Jose Pesero to the people? He said, oh, he came highly recommended by Asen Wenger. And of course, um, Jose, Jose Mourinho, that these people gave um, their blessings and all that. Yeah, Portuguese, a good friend of Jose Mourinho. Uh, that's not enough when you look at 
when you look at where he's coming from, I mean, it's with due respect to him, he's coached, um, you know, Porto and um, he's been in Egyptian football. He's gone everywhere. The last team he managed was Venezuela before coming to Nigeria. Um, he left after going on paid um, for about over 10 months. And um, he doesn't have the the CV or rather the... The, the 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 statue of a of, of a manager that could handle a team like Nigeria, but he's coming. And initially, he said he wasn't interested because I mean there were disagreements over conversations around his wages, around um you know expectations and all that. So they announced him prior to the Af last Afcon, remember? And then he said he, he was supposed to be at the last Afcon to observe. Then he didn't show up. Um. So um, Austin Egwene was in charge of the team at the last Afcon in Cameroon. So it was all it was a matter of. Who's this guy? Who's Jose Pesero? And then he came back again to say, oh, okay, we've agreed now. And I think the first thing that strikes a lot of people is his wages, 70,000 US dollars, coming from a cash strong Nigerian Football Federation, um, a cash strapped federation who really have to go capping and begging for money. You have a manager like that, 70,000, and you know, you see why they struggle to pay his wages. They couldn't, I mean, they, they only managed to pay the first three months of his salary. They, they struggled to pay, you know, up until the end of his um, first contract. They hadn't even paid him. And then the results didn't really go well for him as well. A lot of people don't like his kind of football. Um, like you said, sometimes he mirrors his 4-4-2 in a 4-2-4 formation. So it makes you actually think that, oh, I mean, because of the kind of players he selects. But in reality, it's his 4-4-2. And um, you look when... The, is the, he, he, did, he really struggled in the beginning to find the defensive pairing. And then you have a Francis Uzo, or the goalkeeper, who many feels like he's being overprotected. And they felt like Jose Pocero should look inwards. There are those preachers of the local league, keen followers of the league, who follow the league religiously, who feel like there are two or three goalkeepers who can actually give Uzo a run for his money. Jose Pocero isn't interested in that. So once in a while, he brings in um, younger go uh, he brings in goalkeepers from the local league, but they are there to train. He still goes with Francis Uzo. So the fact that a lot of people feel like he doesn't listen, and trust me, how many managers listen to fans anyway? Who listens to the media? You've got to go and do your thing. But in doing that, you've got to also let the result back you. And so what he's done is he struggled for selection in the defense line. Um, Francis Uzo, like I said, is a question mark. And then in midfield, every time, it seems like every time the NFF are looking for a manager, they tell him, if he says, I don't really like midfielders, he's the man for the job. And everyone and then people are like, why is it that every time Nigeria announced their squad, we have five midfielders, four midfielders? What's going on here? We felt in the D is is the is probably the only midfielder there that we, of note that everyone can say, oh, he's a midfielder. But then again, we felt he's not the same player all over again. We, he's played as a defensive midfielder for Nigeria at Leicester this season. We see him playing more as an attacking midfielder. So he hasn't really done that job. Rafael Onyedika, who plays um, in the Belgian League, who is undoubtedly um, one of the top players in the Belgian League. Joseph Pocero doesn't have confidence in him, but the player is a good player. So these are the things that people talk about and they are like, what is he doing? And then his decision to often go with, you know, um, two strikers, you know, similar in a way, you know, like maybe Victor Boniface, Victor Osimen, or this and that. People are like, well, you know what, with this manager. So I think he's a manager who, when you say, is he, he put he set his team out to play. I've watched them in friendly matches and I still don't understand what he's trying to do. So it's like you have a manager who who is handling Nigeria. And this is no, I'm not a manager, I don't have a license to practice. But you have a manager who is who probably doesn't understand his players. He doesn't understand how best to bring out the best in the Nigerian players. So I think these are many more are things that have actually set a lot of people. Um up by saying that, look, this is not the man. And the fact that he seemed to be desperate for to continue as coach of Nigeria. Remember, his contract ran out, but it's also like Cameroon all over again. It, it, uh, the general draw was fired, and then we had um, a temporary caretaker manager. So people didn't, I think the NFF couldn't afford to not have him continue in his role. And then there was the World Cup qualifying coming as well. That's the only reason why he's earned another contract. And then from 70000 he's now on $50,000. It shows desperation in so many ways, in many ways you can define desperation. So I think that's the situation with him right now. He plays his 4-4-2, his defensive line is not set up properly, his midfield is a big, it's, it's not a beat, it's very weak. And then in attack, he has um, stars who can actually light up any team in the tournament itself. These are players who get into any team, the Nigerian striking position. 
But Jose Pesero doesn't have the style, doesn't have the conviction of even the team to actually say, this is what I'm playing. Because sometimes his animated figure has actually scared off some of the players. And some of these top, um, senior players have always complained. Stop backing at our right backs. Stop backing at players. These are you don't you don't back others. You don't you don't shout at them because it also unsettles the player as well. So some of them have actually spoken to him quietly, like you know, but boss, can you you know not you know yeah, change up, the way you players. speak? Yeah, change. be careful, IT. But he's a he's a very um, energetic and you know he's he speaks so emotionally and passionately on the touchline and. In in the heads of some players, it's good because it puts them on their toes. But generally speaking, for a Nigerian player, for their mindset, their culture, they feel like, yo, bro, if you can play, why don't you just get your boots and get on the pitch? <laughs> um, it's my job. I'm a professional and all that. So by and large, he comes across like a good guy. He comes across like someone who who has really settled in now. You know, he has really settled in, understand the Nigerian cult, the Nigerian mentality. He knows what the officials are looking for. And his last interview really exposed a lot of things. I thought he was his own man, but then again, he's saying um, they gave me this player, which which is the last goalkeeper that just came in, um, Stanley Wabili, who plays in the South African League. Apparently, he wasn't going to go and look for any new goalkeeper. <laughs> so he's saying, um, I was going to have this, but the NFF told me about this guy. So for me, there's so much about the man, but he's the coach of Nigeria. He's the one in charge of Nigeria. So he will be the man taking care of Nigeria's business when they get to the AFCON. So, so so let's talk about a probable 11 then. How do you think Nigeria is going to line up? I know sometimes there can be variations, but is it going to be that 4-4-2? And, and who do you think, can we go position by position, starting with the goalkeeper? Uh, who do you think is going to be lining up for, for Nigeria's first match? Francis Uzo is going to be in goal. Um, he hasn't hidden the fact that he likes him. And he says, he says whenever there's a criticism, he says, um, why criticize the goalkeeper? Why not criticize the strikers who don't score goals? So, he likes him and he wants everyone to rally behind him. And um, in the right back position, it's obviously going to be Ola Ino. Um, Ola Ino is, is the one. He's, he's, he's shown at Nottingham Forest um, what he's capable of doing. And um, he's, he's a veteran of um, two previous AFCONs as well. So he comes in with the experience. Francis comes in with experience too because he played um, in... He's, he's come to two AFCONs previously as well. And then in left back position, there's Bruno Oyemechi. Oyem, Oyem, uh, I hope the son him I get it. Uh, Bruno. Um, Bruno is the one who plays um Boa Vista in Portugal. He's someone um is someone that Pesero knows obviously he knows very well. They are being managed by the same um agent, so he knows him and then he plays is 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 coming leaps and bounds, he's actually proven himself as well. And in, in center back is where there's the conversation. So he prefers to go with Shemi Ajayi and Calvin Barsi. And a lot of people feel like um Having Barsi, good defender, he needs someone who is calm beside him. Or oh, and this is something that Shemi Ajayi should provide. But Shemi Ajayi sometimes comes off like he's his jittery, like he comes unsettled as well and indecisive when it comes to decision making. Some people feel like you know having um Kenneth Omeru, you know, William Trust Ekong on the bench, and of course Chido Ziawazi, these are experienced center backs, like. If you opt for one of those two, your preferred one, maybe you should have one of the experienced ones as well beside that player. But then again, we've seen from the matches under him that he hasn't had a settled centre-back. This is his choice, not the opinion of a lot of people. And like I said, the opinion of others don't count for a manager who wants to do his own thing because everything rests on his shoulders. So he's always going to be like that. And then going in midfield, as of course, he's going to have um, Wilfred Ndidi. He's the number one choice in that midfield. And then maybe um, he settles with um, Alex Iwobi as well to, 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 to sit there in the midfield. But then again, you're asking yourself um, what exactly is behind that logic. But that's what he will do. And then on the right, he's obviously going to go with Aruna Lukman. Um, uh, sorry, <laughs> I said Aruna Lukman. Um, Ademola Lukman, sorry. Ademola Lukman, um, the Atlanta player. Wilfred Ndidi played for Leicester as well. You know, Alex will be with Fulham. And then on the left, he's definitely going to go with Samuel Chukweze. He's going to go with Samuel Chukweze on the left. Now, in, in the striking position, obviously, we know it's going to be Victor Osime and maybe Victor Boniface. Um, he's tried that in, 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 in the friendly against... Um, he's tried that in... Actually, yeah, he's tried that in... Zoto, I think, yeah. Zoto as well. So, um, that's how his mind works now. Maybe with the camp in Abu Dhabi now, they may have a change of plan or change of arrangement, but these are a stop 11, you know. And then when things goes bad for him, that's when he remembers a winger like Moses Simon, 
who is experienced. And then because for, for everything Ademola Lukman does in the Italian Serie A with Atalanta, he can't really, he tends to struggle to produce that in the colors of the Super Eagles. So Moses Simon, remember, he was the star of the last AFCON. Um, Moses Simon is somebody that brings, you bring out the best in him when you've completely write him off completely. So it sometimes settles for that. Ball. Even his set pieces are, are incredible. You know, it's huge, especially yeah. with a player like Shemi Ajayi, you know, or players that can head the ball and stuff. So, Absolutely. So um, other than that, I mean, is Jose Pesero is highly predictable. These are going to be, this is going to be his lineup. If I'm an opposition coach, I can easily see how he's going to set this out, set out this thing. <laughs> but it's, um, it's just, it's just how he's done his thing. And the fact that, um, yeah, you know, the said insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different as, um, result. But that is coaching style. That is what he's going to do. Very good. Uh, we have two more sections uh, to the podcast. Next one is going to be the star player, but I think this is an easy one. It's Victor Osiman. It had to be. He's the best player in Africa. So let me ask you a, a twist on the question. Um, are there any doubts that Victor Osiman can perform at the very highest level at the AFCON? Maybe because of, of, you talked about the monumental pressure that's on his shoulders. Do you feel like he can he can handle that? I mean, he, held, he handled it in Napoli. Uh, Nigeria has a lot of pressure as well. Is there any doubts for, is there any questions about his ability to maybe carry Nigeria at the AFCON? And if so, why? No? There's no doubt. Um, like I said, Nigerians, when they are for you, they, talk, they support you. And when they believe in you, they have strong faith in you as well. So the only problem that I think, the only doubt a lot of people are having is who is going to supply the, boy to, the ball to Victor Simen. And um, in the style of, in the style of Jose Pesero, what makes what plan B does he have when Victor Osimhen starts struggling? Because when he's the obviously the star player, opposition coaches will have plans on how to handle him at tournament. But he's the kind of player that doesn't buckle. Uh, he doesn't. He, he he fights like I said. He's not. He's not too egoistic to not drop back. He drop. He drop down. You, we've seen him drop down for Napoli, picking up the ball, building. You know, in build up plays to get the attacking. So he's not the kind of player that you have a plan for. You can say you want two man on him, double. Double, double uh, you know, like doubling up on him. But Victor Simon definitely has everything within his power to perform. The only challenge, the only doubt, or where the question mark will come will be who are those to supply the ball to him? And um, in what way can um, Joseph Pesero brings out the best in him when, you know, when, when he's actually struggling? But I think that question will be answered again in Abu Dhabi when they are camping because there was an interview where he's talking about we are seeing our players now and we are thinking of other things. We are thinking of other things, meaning he wants to try out a new style or a new a new way of, you know, playing his style. And because this is African Cup of Nations, it's the, the, you know, people people will not forgive you if um, you make mistakes in your first game. Just a, a very, very quick follow-up. I think the most informed strikers that Nigeria have are probably Osimhen and Boniface, but are they the most complementary? Do you think that there's maybe another striker that fits Osimhen better, maybe somebody that's going to drop deeper, somebody more creative? Or do you think, no, they, they should roll with those two in particular? Um, I think for some people, they felt like um, Terry Murphy, Terry Murphy could have been that option. Um, for some, they obviously think, you know, Kelechi, um, Kelechi. Yeah. He's oh, more I creative, right? He drops more and... creative. I also think um, this is one aspect that I actually forgot, like when I was talking about it, um, starting 11. Um, Kelechi is an important player. He's one of the blues players who can supply the ball. Now, you know, we have fitness issues. You see? And I, I took him out of the starting 11 because as we are recording this, we don't even know if we'll make the AFCON because Leicester are saying they don't know if he's going to come. So the, the, the thing there is, as long as Kelechi is fit, Kelechi is that player who can drop, who can play behind Victor Osimhen. And like I said, it's, it's, it's all about how the team functions. How you want your team to play? You know, people talk about low block, this block, that block. For Nigeria, there's no block. For Nigeria, it's all about. <laughs> for, Niger for Nigeria, it's all about. It's all about. You know, this coach. This is what I want. And then sometimes the players always say they don't know. So for me, I think a player like Kelechi, Kelechi can play behind the striker. He can actually make that happen for Victor Osimhen. He's done that before under Genetro. We've seen that under Genetro in the past. And maybe he's the, he's the striker that can actually do that. But not having not having the two victors will be a big big obstacle for Nigeria themselves. You know, like how do they how do they function in that aspect? You know, and um, yeah, so I think that player who can actually play behind him will be um, Kelechi Enacho if he's certified fit enough to come to the Afghan. 
Very good. Uh, second last question. Uh, who is a player on the Nigerian squad that maybe the general African public doesn't know or the general international public don't know, but that you think that could maybe raise some eyebrows, maybe impress, uh, and will be a little more well-known after the tournament? <laughs> that's a very... Um, that's a very... I think uh, maybe Bruno, because... He hasn't he hasn't really played at any top Bruno because um in the beginning I was a bit like I was skeptical, but then I've seen he's built confidence. When you start matches, when you have a manager who believes in you, you all it brings out the best in you. I think Bruno will be one of those. Um I think all the players who are going to the AFCON are probably experienced. And then Stanley in Wabili, the goalkeeper as well, because I mean he plays in the PSL in South Africa. Not a lot of people know cheaper United or whatever. Nobody, people don't really pay attention to the PSL as well, apart from maybe Sundowns, Pirates and Kaiser Chiefs. So I think because he's a goalkeeper coming from there. So if he gets a chance, who knows? Um, if Becerra is going to surprise anyone and bring him on, just a few months ago, he was in the Nigerian Premier League. Now he's playing in the PSL and people are talking about him being the ideal replacement for Francis Uzo. So those are two players I can actually think of at the top of my head, older players, Victor Boniface, they know him in the Bundesliga. Um, you know, there, there aren't many players in the Nigerian team who are not known to the African. That's how big the caliber, that's how big and strong the credentials of the Nigerian players are. Yeah, very, very strong team uh, on paper. Uh, let's wrap it up, Sheena. Um, what would be considered a good tournament for Nigerians? What would be considered a bad tournament for Nigerians? Or what would save Pissero's job and what would eliminate him completely? His job is tied to a um a semi-final sport. That is the that is that is the mark they've given him. Um so he has to he has to if in my opinion, I also think he has to better that. <laughs> I think he has to get to the final to actually stand a chance of getting because his contract runs out at the end of February, at the end of the tournament, actually. So um they said get to the semi-finals, that's all we want. But I think for him to continue, he would have to get to the finals, in my opinion. Um for Nigerians, I think because of what is going on, I think semi-final will be a great tournament for Nigeria. Great tournament. Group stage exits will be a disaster. And then remember, the round of 16 exits last time didn't really go down well with a lot of people, especially with the way Nigeria played and the way they started the tournament, going unbeaten in the group stages. So I think this time around, um, a lot of people, because of how the tournament is going and everything, you know, we have three teams that could actually qualify from the group stage. So Nigeria potentially, I mean, they hardly go out in the group stages. So that would be a disaster. Round of 16 will also be a bad tournament for them because that's what happened in um, Cameroon. So maybe the finish round of 16, that would be a bad tournament. Semi and final would be a great tournament for Nigeria. They've been there before. Um, last one wasn't a good one. So I think for a lot of people in Nigeria, Winning it all the same is what the NFF said. They said, let's do it again. I wonder what they want to do again. They said they want to win the tournament again, but the team doesn't show that. But I, like I said, in 2013, I was one of those who didn't really believe in the team throughout the group stages. And then when they got to the knockout stages and I start looking at Stephen Keshi again, and I'm saying, you know what, this could probably be it. And that's why some a few, a handful of people are believing this could be 2013 again. But for me, I think should Nigeria make it to the semi-final, it will be a great tournament. We'll leave it there. Uh, thank you, Sheena, uh, for all of your insights. That was very, very informative. Uh, do keep it locked here on the African Five Aside podcast brought to you by www.africasacountry.com as we continue to preview all 24 teams that are going to be participating at the Africa Cup of Nations. Sheena, thank you one last time, uh, and we'll see you all soon. Peace. Thank you.